So you have asked me uh, <clears throat> what is the relationship between emotions, feelings, and the thoughts that uh, randomly go through our mind. And how do these three things uh, affect our physical body? Remember that uh, I have already discussed that there are three essential aspects of the human being. First is the physical body. There is no human being without a physical body. And second, there is um, an intellectual dimension to the human personality. And then there's spirituality that also uh, deepens uh, the human personality. So now the question is that these three things uh, <clears throat> human body, intellect, and spirituality, are they in some ways related to uh, emotions, feelings, and, and uh, thoughts uh, that pass through our mind? Uh, let me first distinguish between uh, emotions uh, and feelings. There's a lot of literature on uh, the distinction between emotions and feelings. Uh, and I want to uh, discuss these two things from my observation and from my understanding of uh, these two very important aspects of our, our being. I see emotions as more instinctual. They are based uh, and related to our uh, instincts. So, um, I think the greatest emotion, for example, is the emotion of fear. Uh, as a human being, uh, we are programmed uh, with fear. Uh, fear is one of our basic instincts. Uh, for example, if we see uh, an animal that can attack us, uh, we are afraid of that animal, so fear uh, is caused in our physical being. And there are certain uh, chemical changes and certain physical response in our physical body uh, to that element of fear. Uh, we probably would run away if we can from that animal, and if we can't run away, then probably we will put up some fight in order to, in order to survive. So the emotion of fear is uh, related to our instinct of uh, survival. And I think it's a good thing. Fear is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And uh, there is no need to completely eliminate fear from our being because once this uh, emotion is completely uh, eliminated from our existence, then we are weakening our survival accordingly. Uh, of course now, there are certain um, uh, patholo pathological expressions of fear, and I will discuss that a little later. Uh, but let me first distinguish between emotions and feelings. So emotions are related to our uh, physical body. Uh, emotions cause changes in our physical body. Uh, similarly, for example, hunger, if we are starving, uh, and our physical body would demand that we consume something, we eat something which would be helpful for the body to survive. So again, the emotion of hunger uh, is, is a emotion of survival because uh, if you uh, eliminate this emotion from your existence, then your body uh, would accordingly uh, emaciate and perhaps die. So, emotion of anger is also somehow related uh, to our physical body. 
Now when we are angry, it seems like anger is also a sort of defense mechanism and it is also a survival technique. When we feel that we are being uh, attacked uh, by another human being, not by an animal, but by another human being, uh, we exhibit anger, uh, which is disapproval, which is uh, uh, sort of fight response, uh, and uh, it is closely related to fear. Of course, we can also have fear with respect to human beings, uh, and in that case, fear and anger may together constitute our complex response. Uh, if somebody uh, is trying to harm us or if somebody is trying to um, weaken us, then we exhibit uh, fear and also exhibit anger towards that person. So these strong emotions, uh, whether it is the fear of, uh, whether it's the emotion of fear or whether it is the emotion of anger or whether it is the emotion of uh, uh, getting food. Uh, these are all related to our physical survival. So in my understanding, uh, the emotions and, and survival are very closely related. And, uh, and it's not the ultimate survival. It's not that we're gonna die if we don't exhibit or if you don't display the emotion. Uh, now there could be uh, weaker forms of that emotion. For example, anger could be very strong and it could be less strong, it could be weak, uh, it could be milder. Similarly, fear could be very strong and fear could be milder. So the emotion, the intensity of emotion uh, may vary according to the situation and according to the threat uh, posed to our physical survival. Now some uh, scholars also list uh, uh, greed uh, as uh, an emotion. Uh, I would not put greed as an emotion. I think uh, as I further explain the distinction between emotion and feelings, then maybe greed belongs to the realm of feelings rather than emotions. Um, but let me define emotion one more time as a response to some physical threat. And uh, so it's, a, it's cyclical that the, f the emotion and the objective threat and the response by the physical body and the changes in the physical body because of an external threat, they're all related. So you cannot, you know, take one out of this uh, uh, cycle because they constitute uh, the complete cycle. So there's an objective threat, there is a physical response, there's fear, fear causes changes in the physical body, and the changes in the physical body respond to the fear. So they're all uh, organically related to each other. Uh, now feelings, on the other hand, are not related to survival. So by definition, I exclude the concept of feelings uh, from the realm of survival. To me, feelings are um, sentiments that we acquire not through instinct, but through culture and socialization. So that is the distinction between emotions and feelings. That emotions are directly related to our biology. It is part of our physical being. 
emotions are cannot be separated uh, in any way from our physical being. Uh, they are caused by our physical body and uh, they are they make changes in our physical body as I just explained. Whereas feelings, they might also affect our physical body. And there might be some, you know, chemical changes, some physical changes in our physical body, but the feelings are related to social behavior. For example, if we read a, a passage from Hamlet, uh, and if we are Anglophones, if we speak English, if we understand English, and if we are interested in literature, and if we are a student of Shakespeare, then reading from Hamlet is going to generate some feelings in us. These could be the feelings of joy, these could be the feelings of uh, appreciation, these could be the feelings of uh, relishing the use of language. Uh, but all these responses to the reading of Hamlet, uh, they are related to our acquisition of the knowledge of the language of English and acquisition of the knowledge of literature and the acquisition of the appreciation of Shakespeare. So the feelings of joy uh, are related to our uh, social behavior. Now a person who doesn't understand English uh, is not going to respond to a reading from Shakespeare's Hamlet because that person is doesn't have uh, the basic uh, knowledge uh, which is socially acquired to to have any feelings uh, with respect to um, with respect to the reading of Shakespeare, I, I think maybe there might be a response of uh, boredom. There might be a response of uh, uh, confusion, disconnectedness. Uh, so yes, I mean, even though. Uh, the person is not understanding Shakespeare, but if he's forced to respond, then there could be a response of boredom and, uh, and you know, why am I in it sort of response. But even that, I think, is socially acquired because the feeling of boredom uh, and the feeling of why I am subjected to the reading of Shakespeare is also a social behavior and it has nothing to do with our instincts or very little to do with our instincts. So that is the basic distinction I make between feelings uh, and emotions. That emotions are um, deeply connected with our instincts and most importantly our instinct of survival. Um, uh, sexual, sexual, sexual emotion uh, is not related to our survival. Uh, a human being can live without sexuality, and a lot of, not a lot, but many, you know, single people do. Uh, they have no desire to have a sexual mate. They, even if they have a desire. They might not be able to get a sexual mate. And therefore, the satisfaction of sexuality, even though it is instinctual and it causes uh, changes in our physical body, uh, but it is not an instinct of survival uh, for the individual who lacks sexual satisfaction. Of course, uh, sexuality is the ultimate uh, instinct of reproduction uh, and uh, the survival of the species. But uh, not having sex 
for your entire life uh, may reduce the number of years that you would live because a sexually um, satisfied person probably uh, lives, if everything else is constant, lives relatively longer than a person who is sexually starved. But, but the point is that even the emotion of sexuality is, is related to our instinct. So uh, all emotions are manifestations of instinct uh, or instincts in plural form. Whereas feelings, whether they're feelings of joy, whether they're feelings of sadness, whether they're feelings of greed, uh, even greed I mentioned before. Now greed one might, might, might argue is connected to our survival because uh, we want to accumulate uh, stuff in order to preserve our physical body and therefore greed is a sort of pathological response uh, to our instinct of survival because we are trying to hoard more than we need in order to uh, in order to preserve our physical body. Uh, I think you can say that, but nevertheless, uh, if we disconnect greed from instinct and uh, instinct of survival, then greed essentially is, is a social behavior which varies from culture to culture. I mean, some cultures breed more greed than others. Uh, for example, uh, Unfortunately, the American culture, which has a lot of good things going for it and people who live in this culture, nevertheless, for some odd reason, also promotes greed. And uh, uh, people are, you know, selfish, people are trying to accumulate, they are afraid to lose their uh, belongings and therefore they are overly um, uh, cautious, they exclude, you know, even their family members sometimes from what they have. Uh, of course, not, you know, everybody is greedy in America and not everybody is not greedy in other cultures. It's all relative and it's all proportionate. But there are cultures which are very altruistic and there, the sentiment of sharing with others is much stronger than the, sh than the sentiment or the feelings of hoarding and not sharing. Um, so the altruistic cultures and selfish cultures, if you want to divide uh, the cultures into this binary division, just to understand the concept of feelings, then you would say that the feelings of greed uh, are acquired more easily and perpetuated in a culture uh, where acquisition is more important than sharing. Uh, but definitely greed is not uh, universally related uh, to instinct because if it were, then every human being would be greedy and there is no evidence uh, of that claim that every human being is greedy. Um, but every human being will do, you know, requires food and every human being would uh, do something to get food or to, you know, get shelter. Uh, uh, but greed is not instinctual. Greed is an acquired social behavior. So one more time, emotions are uh, related to our instincts and feelings are related to our social behavior. Uh, now sophisticated cultures uh, could have generated very sophisticated feelings. Um, whereas crude cultures or crude communities, uh, they also generate feelings, but feelings may be crude and they might not be as sophisticated or as subtle as they might be in another culture. Now, I must uh, uh, say 
that feelings are also related to knowledge. So, in, in other words, feelings are Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic. They are related to knowledge. And the more knowledge you have, the more sophisticated feelings you will have. And the feeling of the feelings of joy, the feelings of appreciation, the feelings of uh, irony, uh, that you see irony in human situations. Um, and uh, you begin to enjoy uh, the human relationships um, and, and the exchange of feelings between human beings. Uh, much more profoundly if you have a deeper knowledge of uh, human psychology and sociology. So in other words, uh, feelings uh, are assets uh, that you develop uh, through observation, through acculturation, uh, through knowledge and through observation. Uh, when all these things uh, come together, a, a person's feelings are much more, uh, you know, subtle and they are much more varied and uh, uh, they are much more uh, um, rich in their uh, quality and quantity. Um, now, as I said earlier, that emotions very strongly related to our body that people are so angry that they might have a heart attack, that people are so angry that they might have a stroke, that people are so sexually starved that they might rape someone, and people are so hungry that they might steal food, uh, people are so afraid that they might uh, kill someone. Um, so. Even the right of self-defense is, uh, is an intellectual response to fear. That if somebody is trying to attack you, if somebody is trying to kill you, then you have a right to defend yourself. So the right to defend is uh, an intellectualized response to fear. Um, so fear is closely related to the physical body. Fear causes uh, chemical changes in physical body. It uh, causes mechanical changes in physical body, uh, motor changes in physical body. Your you know, limbs uh, change and they begin to uh, activate themselves in order to um, face a situation of fear. Uh, whereas feelings, they might cause changes in your chemistry and in your physical motor uh, operations. Uh, for example, smiling is a response of feelings. Um, even laughter is a response of feelings. But uh, emotions are stronger and their response is sometimes, you know, so strong that it actually hurts the physical body. Now the third thing that I want to bring in are the thoughts. Now by definition a thought is neither an emotion nor a feeling and it is sort of intellectual process that goes through your mind. For example uh, let's say a thought passes through your mind that democracy is a better form of government. And let's say that you're writing a, a book or an article uh, where you're trying to conceive a conception of democracy which would be universal. In fact, I wrote such a book called A Theory of Universal Democracy. And I was arguing that liberal democracy with markets and individual rights um, and uh, property 
uh, might not be a universal model. And there might be other cultures and communities uh, who do want representative governments, but their commitment to open markets, their commitment to private property, uh, and their commitment to individual rights may not be the same as it is in a liberal democracy. So when I was writing that book or when I was thinking about the ideas or an, when I was researching for that book, uh, there were some feelings, of course, you know, uh, there were feelings uh, that came into that book and probably some passages reflect those feelings. But on the whole, uh, writing that book is an intellectual process. It involves my physical body, it involves my brain, it involves my hands when I'm typing on a computer, uh, and maybe I'm drinking a cup of tea when I'm writing. Uh, I get up early in the morning to write. So there is the involvement of physical body when you are engaged in a thought process. Of course there is, because ultimate, ultimately uh, physical body is the most important uh, aspect of our existence and whether these are emotions or feelings or thoughts they're all you know somehow connected and related to our physical body and they affect our physical body but it's the degree of relationship that matters in distinguishing these three things so you could say that there may be a thought or a thought process that causes very minimal changes in your physical body. And uh, they're so insignificant that you could say that physical body is almost uh, not affected by that thought process uh, or by, by, by those thoughts. So I think that is the distinction uh, that I have in mind when I am uh, saying that emotions, feelings, and thoughts, they are different and we should understand them differently. Uh, emotions are related to our instincts. Feelings are related to our uh, social knowledge and social behavior and thoughts are somewhat more uh, intellectual they are the uh, products of a brain that of course is a part of a body but you may think a um, lot of things but still uh, the changes in your physical body are minimal I think there's going to be a storm, so let me pick up uh, this window curtain, and it's raining outside. But, uh, and rain is, you see, uh, when you look at rain, it could be a very pleasant feeling, uh, particularly if the rain is not threatening your physical survival. If you're sitting inside the house and it's raining gently outside and even if there is some you know thunderstorm and some uh, lightning uh, you can still sit inside safe uh, and enjoy uh, the uh, rain so this behavior enjoying the rain uh, to a large extent uh, is uh, related to feelings and perhaps to your thought process and very little may be related to your emotions. Now let me briefly talk about uh, the pathology of emotions and the pathology of feelings and the pathology of the thought process. Now the pathology of emotions is that when 
emotions begin to affect uh, your physical body negatively. Uh, now, when there is a clear danger to your survival, then fear is a great instinctual response to it. But we also see that sometimes uh, the emotion of fear is socialized and sometimes it becomes part of the thought process. And that's where things begin to become complicated. Because we take something which is very instinctual and we begin to convert it into social behavior and then we also begin to uh, incorporate it into our intellectual uh, understandings. And that's where uh, emotion can become uh, negative or pathological. For example, uh, totalitarian governments or unpopular governments, or governments which are illegitimate, or invaders and occupiers, or apartheid regimes, uh, all these unlawful and illegitimate and morally uh, um, corrupt, if you, if you will, uh, regimes, they use the emotion of fear in order to perpetuate their power or their tenure. And they convert an instinctual asset into a social asset. And they turn an instinct into a national security uh, mechanism. Uh, so the fear that somebody is going to knock at the door in the middle of the night and the soldiers are going to come and they will, you know, trash your house and they will abduct your uh, family members and your family members would disappear and then you would never hear from them or they would be you know killed and buried uh, in mass graves so we see you know this fear that the government is going to uh, commit uh, certain acts against you and therefore, in order to avoid those consequences, you should better do what the government wants you to do. For example, uh, most such governments want you not to criticize them. So uh, they chill your speech, they, they suffocate your uh, opposition to what they're doing, and, uh, and out of fear, uh, you just accept uh, their tyranny, their, their imposition on, on the society and the injustice that they cause. So see what is happening, that the emotion of fear has been cultivated and socialized in order to obtain a social objective. Uh, so in that sense, fear has now become a very strong feeling because it is no longer related to instinct directly, but it is related to uh, a government that is trying to physically kill you. Again, I mean, it, to some extent, it is still related uh, to, to your instinct of survival, but now it has also been converted into feelings because, you know, even when the government is not directly threatening you, you still have these feelings of fear. Because you say to yourself, you know, if I uh, go and protest against the government or protest against the government policy, then there will be a backlash, there will be a consequence. And uh, I will suffer and my family would suffer. I would lose my job or I would lose my house or I will be hurt physically or, uh, uh, or my family members will be affected. 
Now, furthermore, the emotion of fear, it is not only converted into feelings, but it may also be converted into the thought process. That people who think and people who are teachers and people who are writers and people who are academics, even though they don't have any uh, fear of government retaliation, they begin to justify uh, in their thought process uh, the tyranny of the government. And I think uh, we saw that uh, in the United States uh, after 9-11 when the big buildings in New York City were dismantled uh, through aircraft attacks. Uh, there was a very strong emotion of fear and anger uh, generated among many, many Americans, even the Americans who live far away from New York City, even in Kansas, for example, uh, far removed from the World Trade Center in New York City. So the attack generated the emotions of fear and anger. And there was this uh, anger that why these people who we allow to come to our country, uh, why do they attack us? And they have done such a monumental attack, uh, which has never been done before. So it was confusion, it was anger, it was, uh, it was fear that they might do it again. And, uh, and so that was a legitimate response. I think any community or any country, uh, when it is attacked, uh, they feel angry, they feel afraid. And I'm sure when the United States attacked Iraq or when the United States attacked Afghanistan, or when the United States attacked Panama, and the United States attacked a lot of countries. But at that time, uh, the people of the United States don't realize that these countries which are being invaded and attacked, they also suffer from uh, fear and anger, uh, very similar, perhaps more, uh, than the Americans felt after 9-11. Because I know uh, Iraq, was bombed, the city of Baghdad was bombed every evening, every night. And some people in the United States actually enjoyed uh, this video of uh, sorties uh, flying over the city of Baghdad and attacking. Uh, so I think that emotion of joy, for example, when Osama bin Laden was killed, uh, that is also understandable, even though a little bit pathological in some sense. But these are the emotions and feelings that are to some extent related to our instincts and our social behavior of, uh, of uh, uh, very complex ideas and, uh, and uh, responses. But what I want to say is that 9-11 also produced a thought process uh, in addition to emotions and feelings. And uh, this idea that uh, Muslims are essentially prone to violence and that Islam as a religion promotes violence uh, became very popular among academics and among uh, scholars and even among people of um, very moderate and some positive feelings uh, uh, about Islam. Uh, that even these people who had had uh, somewhat neutral or even positive feelings about 
Islam and Muslims began to wonder uh, whether there is something in Islam that promotes violence and that um, uh, entices and prompts the followers of Islam to commit acts of violence. Uh, this idea uh, got into uh, the intellectual uh, stream, not mainstream, but it got into academic stream. And a lot of books have been written, uh, some with a lot of passion and some with uh, uh, reason, cold reason, uh, that uh, Islam is a, is, a, is a religion that promotes violence. Uh, I don't want to go into that debate whether it promotes violence or not. I'm just using it as an example to explain to you that how an emotion converts into feelings and how feelings can then convert into intellect. So, so the, these three are not mutually exclusive. They are not, they are not you know, rigid borders between these three. So the border between emotions and feelings is fluid. And the border between feelings and the thoughts or thought processes uh, is fluid. In other words, it's a continuum. It's a, it's a long river in which some parts are more ferocious and some parts are more gentle and some parts are in between. So I think uh, uh, in that sense, emotions are related to feelings and feelings are related to thought processes. But nevertheless, I think we should not confuse them. And we should see that emotions, at least in their genesis, uh, are related to our instincts, whereas feelings are socially acquired and the thought processes are products of intellect and knowledge uh, and research and observation and somehow related to feelings and emotions as well. So the pathology can occur uh, in any part of the so-called river. There could be pathology of emotions, there could be pathology of, uh, uh, there could be pathology of, uh, um, feelings and there could be pathology of the thought processes and uh, and I think once we understand this continuum and the distinctions between them uh, our responses to emotions and feelings and thought processes become uh, more defensible I think uh, it's important to bring into our self-awareness that how emotions are related to our physical body, how feelings are related to social behavior, and how thought processes can be influenced by our feelings. And uh, uh, a pure thought process probably, even in matters of science, uh, may or may not exist.